As I begin, let me just take you back uh, a little over three years. In January 2020, we gathered in this room as a movement from all around uh, in a jam-packed room, as it happens, really with no idea of what would happen as the years would unfold from that point. And I did a talk at that conference, and I announced plans to multiply um, the National Leaders Conference into two identical conferences. Just about. Good job we did that, isn't it, if you, as you look around. And uh, when I was talking in that talk about multiplication and the next season, I said this. What if you've served faithfully and diligently, but there's no evidence of fruit? Might you still be being fruitful? My answer being, absolutely. And I had no idea what was to come when I said those words, but I imagine that since that moment at the start of 2020, some of you may have related to that feeling of serving faithfully and diligently over the last three years without much evidence or obvious evidence of fruit. Picture a tree going through the seasons and how it changes through the year. Back to March 2020, it felt like we were plunged into an unexpected winter with the arrival of COVID. A lot of what we had hoped for was suddenly stripped away. It was a harsh winter which may have felt fruitless for many people with a loss of loved ones, job insecurity, and the most extraordinary social isolation. Churches had congregated in our nation for so many hundred years back, right? Through wars, through plagues, but suddenly they were scattered. We weren't allowed to meet physically for considerable periods of time. It's the first time in multiple hundreds of years that has happened. The physical proximity, which was so much part of our church life, was stripped away. Things which are so much part of our church culture, such as singing, such as laying on of hands, were prohibited by COVID guidelines. Of course, we could still worship God and pray in dispersion, but there was such a loss. While you know, those of us in church leadership were working out how to do church and uh, care for and pastor our people and our communities um, in an extremely difficult time. We were separated from our families, separated from our loved ones. Some were unable to work. Others got to work especially hard, and every area of society was disrupted. And for some of you, homeschooling children somehow landed on top of everything else, and you were now supposed to be a competent teacher as well as juggling all the other things. And then 2021 was really a continuation of this in so many ways. We didn't get to do the two national leaders' conferences that we'd planned two years ago. We live-streamed it from this auditorium with just Susie, Debbie, and me, <laughs> and about four production crew knocking around. We were restrained in so many ways, and church leaders, you faithfully walked your calling out, one foot in front of the other, with limited contact with your people except via a screen. And we worked through continually changing government guidance, pivoting regularly while doing our utmost to provide the best possible pastoral care for church members and others as they navigated these really challenging circumstances. As we moved into 2022, nearly all the restrictions in most of our nations were removed and we met together in this room, which was the first gathering for many people without masks in that whole period of time. And uh, there was an expectation that some degree of normality was really just around the corner. But in many ways, the winter dragged on with a lot of the seeds in our church's life seeming somewhat dormant still and the potential buds, buds of spring barely visible. The experience of most of us was that people came back to church slower than we had hoped. Some never returned, having got out of the routine of church involvement. Some who had faithfully served on teams for years and we were relying on, they apparently re-evaluated their pace of life and didn't return with the same levels of commitment. And so many of us spent our efforts on rebuilding teams. 
And then just as things were beginning to come back together, just as spring looked like it might be coming, we were hit by further challenges. This past year has been extraordinary. The greatest military conflict in Europe in almost 80 years, a rapid turnover of prime ministers, the cost of energy crisis, high inflation, environmental concerns, and insecurity, and uh, strike disruption, I should say. It's no surprise that the Collins Dictionary's word of the year for 2022, anyone know what it was? Permacrisis, defined as a def an extended period of instability and insecurity, permacrisis. The cost of living crisis has impacted our people. It has impacted the income of many churches. Inflation has meant that expenditure in many areas has had to go up, while income has, for many churches, gone down. While we trust for the Lord's provision, the reality is that many of us are looking at our budgets and seeking wisdom as to how to best steward the resources that God has given us in this financial climate. And all this took a toll with many church leaders struggling with the pressures of leading, feeling like they were just spinning their wheels with very little forward progress, some considering giving up. I wonder how much you can relate to that. I wonder whether some of you in many different areas of church leadership have come to this gathering feeling, I'm just not sure I can go on. Just not sure, as one of the speakers this morning said, I, I can do this anymore. You're tired, you're worn out, you're worn down by the circumstances you've had to face over these years. And if that's you, I just really want to encourage you that you are not alone, you're not failing, and this is a really, really safe place for you to receive prayer, to receive encouragement, uh, you know, share with others as you're here. But with all that said, in conversations I'm having with many of you leading churches Outside the vineyard and inside the vineyard, what I'm hearing is that there is a sense that the season is changing. As we have listened to pastors and looked around the movement, I think it's fair to say that just right now, just as right now we're seeing the early buds and blossoms of real spring, uh, slow in coming, but it is coming, that there are distinct signs of spring in our churches. There seems to be a renewed sense of health and of growth, and little buds are appearing wherever you look. There's an increase in people visiting and joining our churches. I heard about one woman who had recently lost her mother, and her grief was so great that she wanted to harm herself. She went out for a walk. While she's out on that walk, she heard singing. She decided to follow it, and she walked straight into the door of Vineyard 61. She was welcomed into the service. She ended up being prayed for, including that she would be able to bury her mother because she didn't have any money required for a burial. And people started to give her money and everything she needed to cover the expenses and actually considerably more was provided. And she said, I prayed that God would send the right people at the right time. And things started happening. I'm still grieving for my mum, but God has saved me and he answered my prayers. Beautiful. We're seeing an increase in the racial and ethnic diversity in our churches. For example, towards the end of last year, Masood, an Iranian man, went to Central Vineyard in Northampton one Sunday, completely out of the blue. And using Google Translate, he shared how he came to the UK, journeying mostly on foot, fleeing violence in his home country. And over the following weeks, he invited other Iranian refugees, including his wife, to come along on a Sunday. And by Christmas, there was a small group wanting to know more about Jesus. And Amin said, we were attracted by your love and how kind you all were to us. Around this time, a new family connected with Central Vineyard, who were originally from Iran, and they have been in the UK for many years and therefore spoke fluent English and Farsi and immediately got stuck into helping with translation. By February, Central Vineyard launched Christianity Explored so the community could explore faith. And Masood shared this, I came to England seeking safety, but it now doesn't matter where I go because I have Jesus. And three of the group were just baptized on Easter Sunday. 
Extraordinary stories. There's healings I can't mention. Wonderful stories. People coming to faith and the people being cared for. Kirk Kuldi. Kirk Kuldi, is that how you pronounce it? Vineyard was recently offered a property. I'm sorry. Okay. Kirk Kuldi. Kirk Kuldi. Kirk Kuldi, Vineyard. Is that close? Was recently offered a property anyway within the local shopping center. <laughs> offered it for free with the utility bills paid for. And they were able to open the doors to this space as a warm place for the local community to visit and rest and talk. And it's just been a huge blessing, especially for those in the community. <laughs> that was quite funny what I just did there, wasn't it, before? But don't laugh, otherwise I may lose it eventually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's even in a serious line. I mean, what can I say? It says, this has been a great blessing, especially to those in the community who are struggling paying their heating bills. After getting to know some refugee families, it became clear to Winchester Vineyard that young people in particular were finding it hard to cope with the huge upheaval that they had experienced. And many were anxious and feeling isolated ahead of the school new year. Winchester Vineyard partnered with other local churches to host an event for young refugees where they could hang out with some local young people from the churches and nearby schools. And their pilot event saw 25 young people come together on their converted double-decker youth bus. Awesome. So I could tell you stories forever. Things are stirring and things are growing. And as we look ahead with the expectation of a new season, there is so much that we can be rejoicing in. A member of the Vineyard leadership team was talking with Steve Nicholson recently, and they were discussing some of the fruit that Belfast City Vineyard is seeing in healings and salvations and other breakthroughs. And they asked, why do you think they're seeing that fruit now? To which Steve replied, because they've been showing up faithfully year after year. Paul exhorts us in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So to each of you who has been showing up faithfully year after year, including the years that have felt like winter, I want to express my gratitude to you and to encourage you to keep going. The temptation in those hard times, hard seasons, can be to spend our energy just trying to hold our ground can sometimes feel like we are even going backwards. At best, it may feel like we're stagnating. But it was in those winter times that we as a movement have invested into the future and prepared ourselves for how the Lord, Lord might use, use us. So at the Vineyard Leaders Gathering last year, we launched the, ministry, the Vineyard Ministry Pathway. We sensed the need to invest in emerging leaders so that our existing churches would be stronger. Uh, and more resilient, more fruitful in the post-COVID era, and that when the time comes, we can pass our churches on to the next generation of leaders with confidence that it's going to go well for them, and of course, so that we can plant many new churches in towns and cities all over our nations. And we are delighted, as we heard just earlier, how the first year of the pathway is gone. Vineyard Essentials, Leadership Essentials is running in 72 churches with over 1,000 students studying, 82 people on the current Vineyard Leadership College in our five campuses in Scotland, England, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and 18 people are studying theology through the partnership with WTC. Nearly 200 attended The Call in November, an online event run by the Multiply team several times a year to help people discern their next steps in their calling. And we are now better equipped than ever before to provide tailored support for people who feel called as potential planters, site pastors, successions, and adoptions. We have multiply regional coordinators in each region and a successions team who are in place to help support and invest in individuals and act as a gateway to wider regional relationships. We've also revamped launch training to work in sync with the college, which we believe will be able to equip those who are called really for the next stages ahead. 137 people from 40 churches came to the Multiply Summit. One of those said, for the first time, my husband and I came face to face with the amount of support from others on a similar journey to us in the movement. We were so encouraged and what had felt like a slightly lonely process of discernment 
felt lighter and more exciting when we left because we realized the wisdom and support that we could draw on. There is an energy and momentum in our training and there's a stirring in the people in our movement. You heard this morning about the launch of Vineyard Theological Training. What a phenomenal resource and at such an accessible price. Uh, We want it to be completely normal for there to be widespread Uh, foundational theological understanding and literacy across our churches. We are well positioned for growth, but our vision is not just incremental growth. It is not just for addition. We want to strongly lean into multiplication. I believe there's an invitation to us all to have a multiplication attitude. Why? Well, because God does, and we're doing our very best to follow where he's going. So starting in Genesis, the first command God gave to humankind was this, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and increase in number. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that comes, moves upon the earth. Adam and Eve were commanded to multiply and to rule over the earth, to bring God's order to this planet, to have children who would have children and also to extend the rule and reign of God, extend his kingdom. That's from the first page. Then the theme continues through the Old Testament with Abraham becoming the father of a nation whose descendants no one could count and through whom the whole earth would be blessed. The New Testament opens with the explosion of the arrival of the kingdom of God and we see this theme of multiplication repeatedly in the miracles of Jesus. It's extraordinary. He doesn't do it by addition. Just watch what happens. We see him miraculously and extravagantly multiplying stuff. So Jesus created at that wedding in Cana. Have you looked at how big those jars are and worked out how many bottles that is? That is over a thousand bottles of wine. He multiplied fish and bread enough to feed thousands with loads left over. In many of Jesus' parables, he talks about the dynamic of the kingdom of God using examples of things which multiply, but not just multiply again, little bits and little additions. The parable of the mustard seed, something very small which grows to become the largest, it says, of garden plants, or the parable of the yeast expanding enough dough to make, how much do you think? I mean, this is one woman just needing some dough to make about 60 full size loaves of bread. The parable of the sower, where the seed landing on good soil yields a crop of up to a hundred times what was sown. And of course, the parable of the talents, where the master commends the servants who have invested what was entrusted to them, and they've seen it multiply. As Charles said this morning, when Jesus comes back, he's coming with an expectation that we have used the gifts entrusted to us for the glory of God. It is evidently God's intention that we are fruitful. In John 15, Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. That's what disciples do. They are fruitful and stuff multiplies around them. And then, of course, Jesus left us with the Great Commission, which in summary, if I could just re-paraphrase, is this. Basically, go with my anointing and multiply disciples and through them, multiply everything I've entrusted to you. This theme of fruitfulness and multiplication is found from Genesis through to Revelation. We want to be faithful to God. We want to multiply in all sorts of areas within the churches that we already have existing, we've already planted. We want to see people far from God find relationship with him. And we also believe there are so many more vineyard churches still to come. It is generally the case that the older a church is, the less evangelistically effective it is. Most churches over 100 years old see very few people coming to faith. One study showed that in churches which have been going for under three years, an average of 10 people come to know Jesus per 100 members each year. For churches over 15 years of age, that average number drops to three. 
There's a lot of evidence which shows that new churches reach new people. And we are told again and again with good empirical evidence that the most effective form of evangelism is starting new churches. We are a church planting movement and there are still so many places where there is not a vineyard church. Let me share some numbers on the state of our nations and the size of our movement. If we turn our attention to our own movement in the UK and Ireland, we are currently in 143 locations. That is 122 churches with a further 22 sites meeting regularly on a Sunday. With the current church plants about to start, we will very soon be in 150 locations. And there are stories in each and every church of lives being changed and, and transformed, but there is so much untapped potential in places that God might be calling us to plant churches in towns and cities across the UK and Ireland. The uh, Office for National Statistics published some analysis which says that there are over 1,200 distinct locations, towns and cities in the UK and Ireland. We currently have 144 vineyard congregations in those 1,200 uh, locations. 101 of those locations are larger. They have a population between 100,000 and a million people. So just over 100 of those. And we currently have vineyard churches or sites in 42 of those 101. And we have a number of vineyards in some of those locations like Bristol, London, Cardiff, and Birmingham. So even in the larger locations, we still have 59 missing churches. As Rick Warren says, we need all kinds of churches for all kinds of people. So there is a desperate need for more Pentecostal churches and more Baptist churches and Methodist churches and Church of England churches and more of all sorts of other kind of churches because there are people who will come to faith and thrive best in those kinds of faith communities. The vineyard is, as we know, one vegetable in the stew. But we are a contributor to the flavor of that stew. We know that the Lord loves the whole body of Christ and we're just one part, but we, because we are that part, we have to be who we are called to be. We have to run in our lane. We're not saying that we're better than any other denomination. We are simply who we are. But here's the thing, no one else is gonna run in our lane for us. There's no room. No one else is gonna plant vineyard churches except for vineyard people and those who join us. There are too many places in the UK and Ireland where there isn't a possibility of going realistically to a vineyard church because the nearest one is just too far away. Picture this, if you're a parent, your child grows up in the vineyard, they go to DTI, they give their life to Jesus, they then leave home either to go off to college or university or with a job uh, to another town and city and uh, there, there isn't a vineyard. And you can see the challenge for a young person who's grown up in the vineyard family and wants to be in a church that feels like home. Paul and Steph Lowe, who lead Manchester Vineyard, received an email from a parent who took two enthusiastic teenagers this summer to DTI. And they wrote this. We were wondering if there were any plans to plant a vineyard in our hometown anytime soon. Looking at the Church Finder page on Vineyard Churches UK, there's nearly an hour drive in any direction to a vineyard, not really viable for building community. We believe there are a lot of what we're calling missing churches. There are churches missing, there are vineyard churches missing. Now that is evidently a problem. But any one of us here today might ask, well, is that our problem? You know, we're busy serving where we are. Maybe we're thinking that planting churches is probably for someone else to engage with. I was struck by the word Charles shared with us this morning, Acadia. Anyone remember what it means? Charles knows. Acadia. It means I just don't care. I just want to say, let's care. And to quote Jordan saying earlier, let's try. Let's try to plant churches and sites in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of places. There may be some planted in very strategic locations where a church might be planted that can potentially then help resource others. Uh, there might be some planted where people just have a burning heart and desire and a vision for a particular place. Some, be, some might be in more urban centers, others in more rural settings. 
Just for fun, let me give you some names of locations of towns and cities where there is currently no vineyard church. <laughs> and see what it does to the map as we begin to imagine together what could be. So this first slide, here are our existing locations. But as we add a few towns and cities which don't yet have a vineyard church, let's just see what it does to the map and the accessibility for people wherever they live. So in Scotland, Fort William, Dumfries. What if in England there were churches in Kendal, Lancaster, Huddersfield, Scunthorpe, Macclesfield, Skegness, Lowestoft, Hastings, and Swindon? What if in Wales, to celebrate this new little mini-series and they're winning some incredible football match the other day, what if there was one in Wrexham? <laughs> Bangor. Aberystwyth, Swansea, Hereford, on the island of Ireland, Sligo, I guess is the pronunciation, Sligo, Sligo, Newry, Galway, Limerick, Cork, Wexford, and maybe even one on the Isle of Man. And there are so many more locations where a vineyard church would be such a blessing. John Simmons, who with his wife Anna leads Vineyard 53 in Chester, told me about a young man who grew up actually here in this church and then moved to study in one of those places where there isn't a church, Bangor in North Wales. And he connected to Vineyard 53 in Chester and traveled by train to a different country a couple of hours each way to come to church. Owen and Charles Worrell lived in a town they still do, called Milford Haven, which is in the southwest corner of Wales. And they'd attended Oxford Vineyard for seven years before returning to Pembrokeshire, where Owen was born and raised. And the vineyard was the only church, really, they called home, but they didn't have one near them. Their nearest vineyard was in Cardiff, over 100 miles each way. Let's hear from them. Um, my name's Owen and uh, this is Karis and uh, we have the privilege of leading a little church in West Wales called Pembrokeshire Vineyard. So we first uh, came across the vineyard um, nearly 20 years ago in Oxford. Yeah, it was an amazing kind of discovery for me coming from a, a rural Welsh sort of Baptist background, walking into a place where it was church on my level and I just immediately felt at home there. And we just just came to the fact that it was like, well, we're vineyard, we're vineyard through and through, but we're also in Pembrokeshire. I think there's a there's a wonderful Welsh word, uh, hiraith, um, which means that real longing and sort of yearning for, for home. And I, I feel that um, that's pretty brilliant word to describe the Vineyard Church for us. We found home at a Vineyard Church at the end of a motorway. Um, I think if you do some like rudimentary math over seven years, it kind of equates to like 60,000 miles just on a Sunday morning. But for us, it was totally worth it. We were coming home, like how far would you drive to go home? I wanted that for people of Hampshire. I couldn't ever expect them to, to drive and do what we did. I knew it was what God had for these people in Pembrokeshire. He had a home for these people to go to. And it was, it was our time to, to bring that to Pembrokeshire. You know, to take away that barrier of the motorway, to take away the, the necessity to travel, to give people an opportunity to, to walk through our front door. We know for some people, and probably through our own experience in many ways, the vineyard was the way that we would most connect with Jesus. And for some people um, that might have no faith at all, the Vineyard Church will be the way that they meet um, our loving God. And, um, and that's amazing. The values and the expression of church that Vineyard is will be the most accessible for some people. And we didn't have that option in Pembrokeshire. Those people did not have that option to come into relationship and experience Jesus. We, we wanted to plant Pembrokeshire Vineyard because it was for those people. It was because 
those people needed a place that they could call their home. That is wonderful. It's wonderful to hear uh, of people traveling many miles to be part of a vineyard, but imagine how many other people wouldn't do that, wouldn't do that trip. How many others would, would step away from the vineyard family or even step away from being part of a church or never discover a faith because they didn't have a vineyard near them? There are so many missing churches. And when we talk about church planting, many of us have a tendency to only really talk about the individual or the couples, we, couple which we call the church planter, okay? Uh, but you'll be familiar with a saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, in many ways, it also is the case that it takes a village to plant a church. We need to be focusing not just on church planters, but on a far greater group who will contribute to a new church's success. We believe the local church is the hope for the world. And when it comes to multiplying churches, as in so many other areas, everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to play. So we're talking about people who feel called to go with the planters, to move their home, their job, their family. People called to stay and cheer them on. People called to support them financially from afar. Those called to become trustees those who will get stuck into serving to enable the first meetings to happen, those who write kind letters and in other ways encourage the church planters, those parents who plant seeds of faith at the school gate, those who help people involved in a church plant to pack their houses up yeah, to, and, and move, those who work in schools and hospitals, shops and offices who are quietly and faithfully telling their friends and colleagues about Jesus and possibly about the church, those passionate about financially supporting planters, and on and on. Might it be too much to say that everybody in the vineyard movement might potentially have a role to help plant these missing churches? I've mentioned this line before, but I love the song from Dave Miller's album, 12-1, Be Exalted, the words of which say this, would you take the little in my hands and use it for your glory? It's not much. But everything I have, use it for your glory. And the chorus, take the little that we have and fill it with your power for your glory. And that's our prayer as we feel the Lord calling us to multiply as a movement. We look around our nations and we see millions of people who need Jesus. We see such godlessness and brokenness across society. We see culture marching headlong away from God's design and wonder, how can we make a difference? All the Lord requires of us is to come to him and ask, how do you want to use me, Lord? How might he be wanting to use us? How might he wanting to be using those who are in our churches? As we and our people get a vision for that, he will take the little that we have and multiply it. We believe passionately that the Lord is more passionate about church planting than any of us will ever be, okay? We believe he wants to see those missing churches and sites in the towns and cities across our nations planted. And when we plant a church, the tide rises for everyone. It rises for every ministry, it rises for the workplace, it rises for the neighborhoods, it rises for the schools, it rises for those far from God, it rises for the marginalized, it rises for the single parent, it rises for families. And Enough said, basically, on that. We believe this is a season of spring, of buds appearing, and we want to do all we can to get behind the planting of the missing churches. Our movement here has been around since 1987, and in that time, we've learned a lot about church planting. And now, with the ministry path, Vineyard Ministry Pathway, over a 1,000 people going through Vineyard Leadership Essentials, the Vineyard Leadership College, the Vineyard Theological Training. We have the means now to train hundreds and hundreds of people to lead well and to lead for the long haul with sound theological training and support from our national networks. What an incredible thing. I think this is a historical moment in some ways as we look into the future. 
When I was in my 20s, if the Vineyard Leadership College had been around, I would have done anything to get there. I used to commute four hours a day on eight trains to go to London Bible College, sometimes for one lecture. If only online study had been invented then, <laughs> I could have been more effective doing things in the church. But, you know, four hours a day. This college is amazing. I've been to it, you know, on a Thursday here, we, one of the sites is hosted. It's, a, it's, it's not a long way to drive to the campuses, wherever you are, basically. It's not an hour or two to be with people who are on the same tra you know, training track each way, once a fortnight or something like that. And you might need to lose a day's pay. Yes. From our experience, we lost two years full-time pay for me to go to London Bible College. But we believed the Lord was calling us to plant a church. And so we wanted to invest time and resources into that much needed training. We're in a good place to invest in the growth of our existing churches, to plant the missing churches and to take ground for the kingdom of God. Let, let's get on board with this because there are missing churches around these nations. And I really want to say to you, let, let's plant them. Let's do successions well. Let's set churches up to grow from strength to, to strength. As we pass the leadership of Trent onto our successor later this year, so that we can focus more on the national family especially, our hope is not that he and the team will simply maintain this thing we built. No, our joy will be that John Bodley will take this on and lead it into its most fruitful years. We laid a foundation. We did what we were called to do. We ran our leg of the race, and our prayer is that this, the next legs of Trent's race will see even greater growth greater evangelistic fruit and greater kingdom impact in Nottingham and beyond. I believe there's an invitation this afternoon for every one of us to consider what our role might be in what God wants to do through the Vineyard Movement. Whether it is a call to plant a church as the senior pastor, the planting pastor, or to go as part of a team, or to stay and serve and invest in the church that God has currently called us to, for some of us, when we hear church planting we talked about, we can kind of switch off and think that's not really for me. But, but what role might you have to play? Maybe you're a worship leader. You could be a small group leader. You may be a trustee or a financial powerhouse that's really going to help that church happen. You may be a prayer warrior who's willing to pray for that church, especially in its first couple of years. What do you have in your hand? He invites every single one of us with all our different skills and gifts to be part of what he's doing across these nations. So the question really is, are we up for that? Will we try? Will we do our part? And we may feel utterly inadequate for the task. We may feel we don't have much to bring. But I believe if we're willing to sincerely say to the Lord, would you take the little in my hands? It's not much, but would you fill it with your power and use it for your glory? There is so much potential for what he might do with us as a movement in the coming season. I believe the Lord is a stirring. Is that a real world, a real word? I don't know, but it came to me as I prepared this talk. I believe the Lord is a stirring. I don't believe any words that I can say can really motivate, inspire, stir, or to really do anything. What words can I say that can inspire you to give up a career? Perhaps a better paid career in something else, to be a pastor on someone's staff. What words can I say to inspire you to leave all the security that you have and probably the best church you've ever been in to go and plant a new church in a different town or city? I'm very aware of the limitation of my words, but I believe this. The Lord is a stirring the Lord is a stirring, and just as he spoke to Debbie and myself, he will speak to some of you. The Lord stirs hearts when he wants something done. It says in Ezra 1.5, God stirred the hearts of the leaders to move location to rebuild the temple. It says in Exodus 35.21, everyone whose heart was stirred brought offerings for the building of the tabernacle. And in Exodus 36.2, everyone whose heart was stirred came to do the work of building. When we came into the vineyard, we loved absolutely everything about it. The way 
we worship, the naturalness of the teaching, the expectation of the kingdom of God breaking in, the ministry times, the care for the poor, and on and on. We loved it. And all we wanted to see was that expressed in England, which is the country in which we lived. And the thought that we could actually plant a church that could express those things was captivating to us. It was like, how could we do that? Well, we need to move first of all to join a vineyard so we could learn how it was done, what a vineyard is, how it functions. And then when the Lord releases us, we are going. And that was always part of our story. We are going to plant a church, almost certainly in Nottingham, which is, of course, where we ended up. But it was the Lord who stirred us. The Lord stirred us. And so I want to invite you to ask, Lord, are you stirring me? Are you calling me to take a risk, to step out and do something scary, to give up my job, give up my city, and move away and go to another place and start or be involved in something new? Would I be willing to take that risk? Would I be willing to pay that price? I trust even right now that the Lord is a stirring.